And now we have uh, Dr. Sarah Haig from Reno in uh, Nevada, who is going to show us how visual discomfort is related to the electrophysiology of the brain. Sarah. Good morning, everyone, or good morning from Reno, Nevada. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you today. Um, I am going to be talking to you about cortical excitability and visual discomfort. And now, as this is a color conference, I am going to be discussing the effects of chromaticity separation, kind of leapfrogging off of some of the work um, that Olivier just presented on too. So I'm going to be discussing um, the effects of chromaticity separation on behavioral discomfort, um, on the, the effects of uh, chromaticity separation on the visual cortex. So this will be where the cortical excitability component comes in. And then what is the effect of chromaticity separation on those who are visually sensitive? So particularly those who have migraine, uh, where photophobia is actually included as part of the diagnosis of migraine. So a lot of this work originated from an episode of Pokemon that aired in Japan in 1997. It contained an episode um, of a scene that where the background alternated between red and blue at uh, 10 hertz. As a result of this single episode, over 100, uh, 700 children reported being hospitalized with seizures. So this led to uh, a variety of studies being conducted to work out what was going on. Why were certain uh, colors more noxious um, to those who are photosensitive compared to others? So here's um, the results from one study uh, by Jamie Parra and colleagues who looked at the likelihood of different color light um, and alternating flicker um, on their impact on the photoparaxisimal response in the EEG in patients with photosensitive epilepsy. So they were looking for electrical um, indices of seizure-like activity in these participants. And so what they found were there were certain color combinations that were more likely to induce these seizure-like activity and other color combinations that weren't. So the worst being the red-blue flicker uh, was particularly noxious, whereas other color combinations such as green-blue were less noxious. But this led to a question as to what was it about certain color combinations that were um, more potent for um, photosensitive individuals compared to others. And so we chose to look at the chromaticity separation or the color difference between the colors presented to see if we could work out um, another metric that might do a good job of estimating the photoparaxismal response. Now, what we mean by chromaticity separation is that we can plot colors in um, a particular map. This is the CIE UCS, you can use the LUV map too. And we measure the physical distance between the colors when these colors are plotted in these maps. So when we reanalyzed the photoparaxismal responses um, from Para's study, as a function of the chromaticity separation, we found that as the chromaticity separation of the colored flicker increased, the higher the number of patients um, showed a photoparaxismal response. And within these individuals, we saw higher photoparaxismal activity overall. So saying that chromaticity separation could be a good metric for estimating the likelihood of inducing seizure-like activity in uh, patients with photosensitive epilepsy. And so this led us to the question, well, perhaps for chromaticity separation could uh, be a good measure for understanding the contribution of color um, on visual discomfort. And so we started with a very simple behavioral paradigm where we took pairs of colors, um, put them together in a grating pattern, and then simply asked participants to rate them on how uncomfortable they were to view. So they would uh, give us a number, we'd move on to the next color combination, and so on and so forth. And so we conducted this over several different experiments with different color combinations. Sometimes we kept the colors isoluminance, so the same luminance. Um, other times we let luminance vary also. And regardless of the color pairs that we used, we found that discomfort increased with greater chromaticity separation as represented by this negative slope across all these different experiments. 
So then we wanted to ask, well, what was happening in the visual cortex? What could be explaining or correlating at least with uh, the increase in discomfort to larger chromaticity separations? So we started by looking at the metabolic response in visual cortex. We use near-infrared spectroscopy or NERS. NERS uses light to uh, measure the color of the surface of the cortex to see how oxygenated or deoxygenated that part of the cortex is. And so when we presented the different chromaticity separations, we found that the larger the chromaticity separation, the larger the metabolic response in the oxyhemoglobin and in the deoxyhemoglobin response we can see here. And again, this was replicated over many different studies with lots of different color combinations, and we found the same effects. Now, this is something that has also been found in the luminance domain too. So here is uh, a couple of studies conducted by Xi Huang and colleagues at the University of uh, at Michigan State University. And they found that um, the metabolic response here uh, mapped using fMRI bold, they found an increase in the metabolic response at mid-range spatial frequencies in headache-free individuals, as we can see here on the, the bottom um, function here, but also in those who have migraine. Um, and they showed a slightly heightened metabolic response. Mid-range spatial frequencies are frequencies that the visual system is particularly sensitive to, um, and so this makes um, complete sense. When they then looked at a group of individuals with migraine and looked at their metabolic response um, with and without um, precision ophthalmic tints, they found that the metabolic response reduced when they were using their optimum tint. So suggesting that there is a tight coupling between visual discomfort and the metabolic response. And so this was still in the, the luminance domain. And so we wanted to branch out and see if this was something that was consistent with our color stimuli as well. So we took a group of individuals who had migraine and a group of individuals who were headache free. And we asked them to rate a number of patterns on their discomfort. We found that regardless of the color pair used, again, we found an increase in chromaticity separation drove an increase in discomfort, but we also found that the discomfort was slightly higher uh, in those with migraine. So migraine across the board were more likely to report these stimuli as being uncomfortable compared to headache-free individuals. This is sort of replicating um, something we've already found before, and extending uh, Zhi Huang's uh, previous findings into the color domain too in migraine. So then we wanted to ask, well, what was happening in the visual cortex in migraine? This time we used electroencephalography um, and looked at the event-related potentials to the same chrom chromatic uh, grating patterns. Now we can see that in our headache-free individuals and in our individuals with migraine, there is a larger negativity here, uh, first and second negativity here, um, across all of our individuals, across both groups, and that this negativity increases with chromaticity separation, sort of mirroring the metabolic effect that I uh, showed just now. However, when I remap these, um, the, the negative amplitude, we can see that there is an increase in that negative amplitude with chromaticity separation. But it's also easier now to see the difference between the headache-free and the migraine groups, where the larger the chromaticity separation, the larger this first um, N1 amplitude negativity um, with larger chromaticity separations. So again, mirroring this, um, the effects that uh, Huang found in the metabolic response, where individuals with migraine produce an even larger or a, a hyper excitable response compared to headache free individuals. So to summarize, the effects of chromaticity separation are that they drive discomfort, they tend to increase the discomfort, they evoke a large metabolic response and a large electrophysiological response. So suggesting that as the chromaticity separation increases, the cortical, um, the cortical excitability also increases. Now, for those who are visually sensitive, particularly those with migraine, they report even greater discomfort and show even larger neural responses, suggesting that they are uh, producing a hyper excitable response here. This is consistent with the effects uh, seen in luminance um, in terms of the um, headache free individuals, but also in those who are photosensitive.
So this led us to the idea that perhaps discomfort is a homeostatic response to reduce the cortical excitation. However, for that to be the case, we need to make sure that the color map that we are using to map our chromaticity separations are also relevant for the biology. We've been using a perceptual color space. And so where then could this perceptual color space be appearing in the visual system? So Brewer and Heger um, conducted a lovely study um, looking at where color um, and how color is mapped in the visual cortex. They found slightly different color maps across the visual system, but particularly in V4, they found that the colors were starting to cluster together. So this is actually the cortical surface and they're mapping the bold response here um, to different chromaticities. Now the organization and the clustering of these different colors looks surprisingly familiar and looks much more like a perceptual color map. So it seems as though we've got these disparate parts of the of V4 that might be becoming really active um, when looking at a stimulus that has a high chromaticity separation and local inhibitory mechanisms might be struggling to constrain that activity, um, which is then driving um, the homeostatic response that's evoking discomfort. So then the discomfort is saying, please look away from that um, visual cortex is working too hard. So that's our working theory for now. So thank you very much for your attention um, and thanks to everyone who assisted with these studies and particularly to all the participants and this is not always the most riveting of studies um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sarah. And a question for Sarah, if I may. Um, does it mean performing duochrome test could elicit seizures? So thank you for this question. I have to admit, I am uh, a neuroscientist, I am not a clinician, and I do not have a background in optometry or ophthalmology. So some of my other uh, panelist colleagues here will probably be better at answering um, this question. However, um, I will bear in mind that the, um, the epilepsy data that I showed from um, Para and colleagues at the beginning of my presentation um, was looking at the color combination um, over temporal frequency too. So there was a temporal component here where the red and green alternated. And so with the duochroma um, uh, test, my understanding is that it's a stable red and green. And so it might not be quite as epileptogenic as maybe those data are suggesting, um, but it probably would be something to um, bear in mind that, you know, some people uh, might be more sensitive to those kind of uh, stimuli than others. But thank you for your question. Bruce, Bruce yeah, do, do unmute and, and join in there. Yeah, I just said just to just to add from an optometric perspective, the duochrome test is the test that optometrists use where, where there's a, a bright red and a bright green uh, patch uh, placed adjacent to each other. I've never come across a case where that triggered um, a fit. And I have seen quite a few people for testing uh, who have been referred to me for colorimetry because of epilepsy. And we've gone through the optometric test beforehand. Um, my personal view is, is, is that you see red and, and green, you see strong colour contrast so often on websites these days and advertising and so on, that I, I don't think an optometric sight test would be a major risk from that perspective. Thank, thank you, Bruce. And Sarah, one, one more question for you. Uh, why are all chromaticity separations more uncomfortable in migraine. This is specifically referring to your headache uh, paper of 2019. Yeah, great question. So the one thing to bear in mind is that the spatial frequency of the patterns that we used was uh, in the mid range um, over all of the studies that we used. So we were purposely trying to um, hit the, the visual system in the area that the, we know that it's maximally sensitive to. And so we haven't looked at the effect of spatial frequency to begin with. So that's probably one caveat to keep in mind. And so we think that basically um, the individuals with migraine that we've been testing are sensitive to all of the patterns that we're presenting to them, probably because we're already kind of hitting an uncomfortable um, range in terms of the, the spatial frequencies. So I think there's probably a little bit more work to do to kind of expand um, exactly what the interactions are but potentially with um, chromaticity separation and with, um, with spatial frequency to see if there might be a point at which migraine and headache free individuals actually kind of are similar to one another in their reported discomfort and then we start to see sort of uh, interaction effects later on so excellent question but uh, bear in mind the spatial frequency component here. 
Many thanks, Sarah.